the one who would come up to her and share all her things with the one who sees her in secret? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. <coughs> Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season uh, we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with Twelve, yeah. It is this <coughs> the good sowing in the sight who will first each be circumcised and only a few days after may not be reaped. For she who is a step ahead is in race who has circumcised and not be reaped. And so since the law is the side of the flesh be circumcised that they first in the flesh but are the opinion to those who kept in the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and Amen. So I thought 25 and 26 is a good intro to the last section here, um, finishing up the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. Um, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So... If you're living by the Spirit, yet not walking by the Spirit, what is that? Is that even possible? I guess you could say you do, but it doesn't seem like being lived out anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. <clears throat> kind of reminded me of when uh, Christ is addressing the Pharisees and pointing out their hypocrisy, their whitewashed tombs dead on the inside um, and claiming to be pure then you have let us not become conceited provoking one another and envying one another so are those, again, are those fruits of the Spirit or works of the flesh? Yeah. So in that mind, then he launches into really how we're to care for one another. So as we as we notice somebody who's who around us he is is caught in transgression or caught in sin it says you who are spiritual who would he be referring to with that i kind of view it as he's talking to the leader specifically and then by and large also everybody who has the Spirit of God with them. Any thoughts on that? Those 
So how do we how do we apply that part keep in our lives? You who are spiritual should restore him. If you see somebody who's living in error, living in sin, does that always mean that you are necessarily the best person to approach them about it? There's there's a little bit of wisdom I would think that would probably goes into this, right? So, pick an example. Gideon, you're not an adult. If I saw you having a problem, I would go to Kevin about it. I'd go talk to your dad first and foremost. It's his responsibility. Um, same thing if you see somebody's spouse, if you see somebody's wife doing something, you'd go to the husband. That's You go to the person who's responsible, who's in charge of these people. There's a time and place for exceptions and everything, but... There's wisdom in calling somebody out on when and where on what's going on. It's not a stop everything around you type moment, usually, and stand up in a crowded room and yell at this person. Um, there's a time and a place for addressing. For Sometimes it should be in private, if it's a private sin. If it's a public sin, if... Kevin's up here spousing uh, things that are obviously contrary to Scripture. Well, that might need a, a public rebuke. Um, and so there's, there, in dealing with transgressions, there's always a degree of wisdom in how these things should be dealt with. So... And there's also a time where you pull somebody aside, and then if they don't listen to you, get a brother to come with you. And if they don't listen to you, then you bring it before everybody. Um, so there's a time and place. If I think this came up a couple classes ago, but this harshest rebuke is for those who are in leadership and are leading people astray. That's always been a public. You got to stop. You're not trying to. You're not trying to hide it. You're you're doing this because. You, want, you need everybody to see what is right, what is pure, what is good. Um, Larry. Yeah, so the, the verse 2 finishes, Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So I found a good quote from Augustine. 
There is no sin which one person has committed that another person may not commit also. Um, which is obvious, but is, is also, you know, profound too. Um, and so as, Larry, like you were saying, as make sure we're not falling into the same trap. Um, Because Paul says something similar, um, where there's nothing that we are not tempted to that has not been uh, common to all mankind. Um, where if, if we're trying to help a brother who's struggling with something, that temptation could just as well be a stumbling block for us. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, verse three, uh, for if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So if as part of the stumbling block that could pop up is you start thinking that, oh, I don't have this problem. This guy has this issue. I'm, I'm doing pretty good for myself. Not realizing or, or forgetting that we are all what in Christ? We're all new creation. We're not. We're all equal in Christ, um, and so as you go through the proper and what we're called to do is we're called to confront people who are in sin to save them from from damnation, but to always keep in mind that it is God who did the new creation. It's God who saves people. We can't do anything apart from Him. There's no good work that we can do outside of Christ. It, it doesn't count us for anything. Pride goeth before a fall. Yeah. A haughty spirit before temptation. No, Is that uh, it? Pride comes before the fall and a haughty spirit. No, I probably never know the scripture. You <laughs> probably do. <laughs> uh, Kevin, this is where you come in and tell us how we're wrong. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Thanks. Uh, Yeah. 
So the next few verses are, well, let's go back to 6-2 real fast because we kind of skipped over that. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Yeah, we've covered that. Um, a lot of people will say as Christians, we're not under the law, which we're not under the condemnation of the law, but we are most definitely under a law and we're the law of God. And we've touched on it a little bit, but to the law of Christ to love one another, is that any different than anything that God has ever stated? No. So that's, that's, Yep, yep. Upon all that, it rests. So you have going back to um, the Mosaic Covenant uh, and and commandments is to love your enemy, love your neighbor. So this is it is a it is a new law in a sense that that Christ has brought it first and foremost in front of us. But it's how God has always commanded us to act and to operate. So the next few verses are almost, like I said, they need to go along with each other because it almost seems like it's, it's conflicting. So three and four. For if anyone thinks he has something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to be boast will be in himself alone and not his own neighbor. So don't think you're anything but boast in yourself. What does that mean? So we, we know boasting in ourselves does not mean talking about how we can do this stuff on our own. So verse 3 and 4, are all, it's, you can look at it and see it. It's, it, it almost looks like it's at, it's at odds with each other. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to we boast himself alone and not in his neighbor. The, the key to this is the not in his neighbor part for kind of understanding what Paul is saying here. So if we spend our time judging ourselves based off of what other people say about us, our neighbors say about us, our neighbors think about us. Is that, is that Christ-centered? Gideon, speak up. You shook your head, so let's, let's hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. We're beholden to our consciences, what God commands us to do, what we are, we feel convicted to do. For if we don't do what our conscience directs us to do, we're, we're in sin. So if, as, which part? If we don't do what our consciences direct us to do through Christ, we're in sin. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we have to take what we think is right and compare it to what Scripture says, right? So, because um, that's the ultimate guide. Is And as we walk in the Spirit, as we live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, what God's wishes are for our life in each circumstance will become more and more apparent to us as long as we stay in His Word. If you say, I got it all, I'm good, and you shut the Bible and walk away, you're going to you're going to forget it pretty fast. <laughs> yeah.
It is, absolutely. <clears throat> All right, so <laughs> then we go back to 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And jump to 6 5, for each will have to bear his own load. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, personal accountability. There's, I mean, you can see this in any avenue. If you are looking for a leader, uh, a manager, a rule, whatever, do you want somebody who takes responsibility for his actions and who owns up to what he's done? And, or do you want somebody who blames other people or overlooks what they're doing in and, and, and pretends it doesn't exist or they didn't do it. So it's, it's in Scripture, obviously, it's going to impact every part of our lives. Um, the person who owns up to what they've done, their past, their past indiscretions, their errors, and takes responsibility for that is going to naturally be somebody that people will start looking to for direction, for leadership. Because if you can take care of yourself and you could acknowledge your own errors and fix your errors, that's somebody that people want to spend time with. And, and isn't it a person like that that you actually want to help? Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're dealing with somebody who pretends that they're perfect and they don't mess up or they keep blaming somebody else, it's really tough to want to help that person out. Um, and again, so when Paul's talking about this, when he says bear one another's burdens, who is he, who is he addressing? Is he addressing everybody in the entire world? Is he addressing believers? These are believers. This is what we're called to do to help each other out. Um, we don't have the same charge to help somebody out who's not a fellow believer and not a neighbor. We don't take care of our neighbors, people who are around us, but he's specifically addressing how believers are to interact with each other, not how to interact, interact with anybody else. He said it in another place, you could have called him the specter of the Lord. Yeah, that's how we, uh, that's, that's one of his finishing thoughts here. I think it's six. Mm -hmm. they, will, they will know you by your love for one another. That's what the scripture says. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that I think there's too much of the, oh, you got to look for yourself, look out for, you know, there's not enough of, in our culture, sharing in those burdens. Um, 
Okay. So, and then he continues on from this thought in supporting one another. So, one who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. So, in this, he's specifically addressing those who are called to be leaders in the church, and those who are, are pastoring, and how the congregants are supposed to treat them. So, when he says, one who is taught the word, that would be those who are being taught, the laypersons, the congregants, must share all good things with the one who teaches. Is there a limit on all? So, if you are a member of a church, if you have somebody in your life that teaches you God's word, you got to make sure they're being taken care of, whether that's exhortation or tithing or ministering to sickness, health, whatever it is. As Christians, we are to take care of those who bring God's word to us and who enlighten our lives. And he goes into seven, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let's not grow weary of doing good, for in due seasons we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are the household of faith. So if we're sowing to our own flesh, we're going to reap what? If we're sowing the works of the flesh, we're reaping destruction. Yeah, he's, he's circling back around. He's referencing it. Um, but the one who sows the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In verse 9, let's not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So do we see the results of our labor right away, necessarily. We may never see the results of our labor in our lives. But if we give up, do we ever reap them? So this would be, again, be a reference to walking away, losing, losing salvation. If we give up, Everything we've done is, I mean, it's all good for God's kingdom. But for us, we've just, we've lost it. Which is a um, sobering reminder. <laughs> and then Paul, as you pointed out, so then as we have our opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Yeah. And just as we have a responsibility to care for the believers around us, they have a responsibility to care for us. And part of that is admitting when you are in need. So if you are actively preventing people who want to help you out, I'd imagine there's a little bit of a burden on the conscience on doing that. So part of helping others is making your own needs help so they can help you when you can't do that yourself. Got a couple more minutes. Any Anything else stand out to anybody else in the section? What do we compare everything to? Right. Yeah. So. We compare it to the word. That's one way to see all the yeah. things that stand out. We compare it to the world. Well, if you if you 
that's, that's, if you look at a person's life, especially easy, 2020 hindsight, and see what fruits their life wrought, you can tell where their focus was at. Um, or if you look at your past actions with what you've done and what came about that, did the fruits of the Spirit come from that? Or did it just sow dissension? Did it sow conceit, strife, envy? And that'll be pretty telling of actually where the spirit of that work was. Yeah, because God knows the heart, and you know your intentions. But from the outside, it can all look good. All right. Well, that finishes it up, and we've got the remainder of six. All right. Thank you, guys.